So now that we've seen some examples of what permutations can look like in some context, what's the abstraction? So how do we define permutations in more generality? And how do we begin to use two different kinds of notation, what I call stack notation and also cycle notation, to express permutations? So precisely speaking, what a permutation of n symbols is, is it's a function. It's a function that associates to each one of these symbols another one of these symbols. Could be the same one, could be a different one. But all we have to do is associate to one of these symbols another one of these symbols, 1 through n. That's the abstraction. And we want this to be a bijective function. Why? Because we can't associate two, of the, two different symbols uh, to the same symbol. Right? I can't, for example, uh, if I want to anagram the word post, P-O-S-T, I can't take P and O and turn them both into an S, for example, when I anagram them. I have to turn each symbol into a unique symbol through this function. So we need this to be a one-to-one -one and onto correspondence. So, for example, if I have five symbols, then any way in which I can jumble up these five symbols by taking one and assigning it to three, 2 to 5, 3 to 1, 4 to 4, 5 to 2, for example. That's one example of a permutation of five symbols, thought of as a function. Um, of course, it's a little unwieldy to write it uh, in one of these kind of uh, hunters and, and rabbits diagrams for a function. Uh, so we also want to develop some notation uh, that we can use for how to think about them. But why this becomes abstract algebra and not just a mathematical curiosity is that if I take the set of all permutations of n symbols, together with the operation of composition, so composing these functions one with another. Think of it as applying one permutation and then permuting the result of that permutation. Right? That together, that structure forms a group. We can show that it meets the associativity, closure, identity, and inverses criteria. And that group is called a permutation group. Or more commonly, it's called a symmetric group, uh, S sub n. Right? So the symmetric group on n symbols, the group of permutations of n symbols. And so we can think of this rearrangement of five uh, numbers as an element in the group S5, the symmetric group on five symbols. I should also mention here that there are some authors, uh, mainly older fashioned ones, I think, um, that instead of using an S for this, they'll use a sigma. So just in case you're coming across any older references, you might see it sometimes called sigma n. Um, but for the most part, uh, most modern algebraists will use Sn uh, for this purpose. So as an example uh, of an anagram, what, how can I express the permutation that turns the word post, P-O-S-T, into the word stop, S-T-O-P? So I know that one of these is going to be a permutation of the other, because we can see that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the elements of this set and the elements of that set, right? This P is going to correspond to that P via this permutation, this O via that O, this S corresponds to that S, this T corresponds to that T. So it's clear that the letters in this word and the letters in that word are related by a bijective function. And if I diagram it out, this is what that function would look like. And we can think of it, remember, as an element of S4, right? the symmetric group on four symbols. And if I wanted to just be explicit about what this function is, I would just have to say, what is sigma applied to each of the elements in the domain over here? If I number the elements 1 through 4, then I can say, well, this is the permutation that carries the first number here, the first letter, p, into the fourth position over on the right. So sigma of 1 is equal to 4. Sigma of 2, the o, carries over to 3. Sigma of 3 gives me 1. Sigma of 4 gives me 2. So as a function, this is what this permutation would look like. And we're being super explicit about it here. You might notice that this is probably not a very scalable way of expressing permutations. If I want to talk about a permutation of 150 symbols, I don't want to list out what happens to every single one of the elements uh, from my domain set here. So there must be a more efficient way. One way to do it would be to use the list notation we talked about in the previous video. If I agree upon an ordering for the elements in my domain of this function over here, then all I have to do is list in order their images. So 4, 3, 1, 2. So that's one way uh, of writing this down. This also becomes what I call stack notation. If we just take that 4, 3, 1, and 2 and we line them up underneath their pre-images, 1, 2, 3, and 4, in a little thing that kind of looks like a matrix, although usually we use round parentheses here instead of square brackets. Um, so this notation, all we do is we match up each of the elements of the domain with its image under this function, sigma. Right? 
And so that gives me a, a handy, slightly more compact way of expressing uh, this permutation. Another thing, before we talk about cycle notation, which is the next place that we want to go, um, an important question for us to ask if we're going to study permutations in abstract algebra is how many of them are there? How large are these groups of permutations of n symbols? Well, let's think about it in this particular example. How many different anagrams of the word post are there? Ignoring, for the moment, the fact that some of them are not going to be English words, right? How many different ways are there for me to rearrange these four letters? To figure that out, we'll just do the typical combinatorial process of, for each of these symbols, asking how many choices do I have for where to send it? Right? If I want to make a one-to-one -one function here, I'm going to have four places that I could send P. I could put it in any one of these four positions over here on the right. But as soon as I've put it into one of those positions, I have one fewer choice for where to put the next symbol. Because right? I can't put it in the same place as I put P, because then this function would fail to be one-to-one. -one. So that means even though I had four choices for where to put my first symbol, I only have three choices for where to put my second. And then I only have two open spots left to put my S, and then at the end I only have one place to put my T. So how many different ways of rearranging P, O, S, and T are there? All those choices that I have are independent one of another, and therefore by the multiplication principle in combinatorics, we can multiply them together to discover that what I have are 24 choices. There are 24 ways for me to rearrange the letters P, O, S, T. Not all of them form an English word, but there are 24 different ways to do so. And a compact way of noticing how 24 was arrived at here is that it was just 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, in other words, 4 factorial. And indeed, the combinatorial principle here is that there are as many permutations of n symbols as there are n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 all the way down to 1. In other words, n factorial. So that's another bit of reassurance that the symmetric groups, Sn, these are finite groups. They happen to be fairly large finite groups. As n gets larger, the number of permutations grows factorially, which is extremely quickly. Right? By the time we get to 10 symbols, we already have 3 million plus elements in our group. Um, no, sorry, 36 million? Sorry, my factorials are, are a little rusty off the top of my head. But these groups get really big really quickly as n gets larger and larger. But they're still finite, and that should give us some reassurance that we can use the principles of abstract algebra to study these groups from an algebraic standpoint. The next question is going to be how to develop cycle notation. So how do we use a, an even more compact notation to express permutations?